Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here, the GMAT Official Guide 2022. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Always make sure the book is in front of you when you're working with me. Today we'll solve some problem as you can see on page number 264. Let's take a look at it. Very first problem that you see there, 296. 296 is a very straightforward problem. We are given this picture here. We are told that this, this angle is x, this angle is y, and the question simply is how much is z? How much is z? The first statement tells us that dx is equal to 50. Simply knowing that x is equal to 50 does not enable us to figure out what z is. Second statement tells the first statement is not enough. Second statement tells us that the y is 35. Again, if we know the y without knowing the x, we cannot figure out the z. But when we put them together, two statements together, we know now this is 50, which is 35, we can figure out this, this angle. And once we have that angle, z is simply 180 minus that angle. The answer is d. Putting the two statements together, we can figure out the answer. Number 297. In number 297, we are told that we are earning 4% compound interest. For five years. We have invested some money. Let's call it P, P for principal. We have no idea what the P is. They don't tell us how much we invested. But we know that we have invested it for five years. It's going to pay us 4% interest compounded yearly. The question that they're asking is, the amount of interest that we earn in third year, the amount of interest that we earn in third year is how much more than the amount of interest that we earn the second, uh, first year? This is what we want to find out. Let's see what they tell us. The first statement tells us that the beginning of second year, beginning of second year, we had $4,160. A beginning of second year is the same as the end of the first year, which means the amount of money that we invested P dollars plus 4% of P dollars must equal 4,160. There we go. If we know this, this equation, we can solve for P. Once we have the P, we know how much interest we are earning. We are earning, earning 4%. We can figure out how much interest we're going to earn the third year. We can figure out how much interest we earn the first year. The interest that we earn first year is very straightforward. It's $160. No, actually, we do not know that yet. Uh, sorry, never mind that, because we don't know how much we invested there. But when we solve it, you will see that it's 160. But the point here is that the first statement is enough. A, D, B, C, E. First statement is quite enough to figure out the amount of principal. And once we know the amount of principal, we can figure out the amount of interest that we earned the third year and the first year. Let's look at second statement. The second statement tells us that at the beginning of third year, beginning of third year, we had $4,326.40. It's the same idea. If, if it's the beginning of the third year, which means we've been earning interest for two years, which means P times 1.04, because we're earning 4%, raised to 2, because the money has been sitting in the account for two years so far, it's the beginning of the third year, end of the second year, and this amount is $4,000, $4,326.40. Again, we can solve for P, and we can figure out the answer. The answer is D. Each statement alone is enough to be able to answer the question. Number 298. Number 298 is a very silly question. 298 asking us how much is the circumference of a circle? How much is the circumference of a circle? And the first, first statement tells us that the radius is 2 pi. Well, if we know the radius, we can figure out the circumference. Circumference is simply 2 pi r, and r we know is 2 pi. There we go. The circumference of the circle is 4 times pi squared. The first statement does the job very nicely. A, B, B, C, E. Answer cannot be B, C, or E. It's either A or a D. The second statement tells us that the center of the circle is 7, 8. Simply knowing that we have a circle with the center of 7, with the coordinates of 7, 8, it's not going to enable us to figure out the circumference of the circle. 
second statement by itself is not enough. The answer is not, it's not D, it is A. The answer is A. Only the first statement by itself, one alone is enough. But the two by itself, two by itself does not get us anywhere. The following question, 298 or 299, is just as silly. It's too simple. The question is, how much is T? The first statement tells us that S plus T equals 6 plus S. Well, if S plus T equals 6 plus S, subtract S from both sides, and we know the T. The first statement is enough. The first statement by itself is enough. The second statement tells us that T cube is equal to 216. Well, if we know the value of T cube, we can figure out the T. second statement by itself is also enough. The answer is D. Let's look at 300. Three hundred tells us that we took our car for a repair to a mechanic, and the total amount that we paid, total dollar that we paid, let's call it D for the dollar, D for dollar, total amount that we paid was the amount of money that we paid for parts, the amount of money that we paid for labor, and we had to pay six percent tax on both parts and labor. This is the tax. This is what we paid. We are also told that the parts is fifty dollars. This is given. The question is, how much did we spend for the repair? We want to find out the D. Let's see what they tell us. The first statement they tell us that the, that the tax, tax on labor was 960. They tell us that the tax on labor was 960. Well, if tax on labor was 960 and we know that the tax is 6% on both parts and labor, that means that 6% of L must be 960. If we know the 6% of L is 960, we can figure out L. We can figure out the amount of labor. Once we figure out the amount of labor, we put it back in here because we already know the P. We can figure out the L. We can put it back here, put it back here. We can figure out the D. The first statement is quite enough. A, D, B, C, E. The answer cannot be B, C, or E. It has to be either A or a D. Do not make a mistake of sitting there and actually solving it. Nobody's asking for it, as I always remind you. The question is, do we have sufficient data? The answer is yes. Statement 1 provides us sufficient data. Second statement tells us that the total tax that we paid, total tax that we paid was 1260. Let's see what we can do here. Which means that 1260 must equal 6% of parts and labor has to equal 1260. But we know what parts is. This is given to us. This is given. Parts of $50. We can put it in here. Parts of $50. There you go. Again, a very straightforward equation. with only one unknown. L. We can solve that for L. Once we have the L, we put it back in here. And we can figure out the amount, total amount that we paid. Second statement by itself is also enough. The answer is D. Each statement alone is enough. 301. Three hundred and one. Here we have some books. We are told that we have B number of books, and the question is, how many books do we have? What we are told is that we have four kind of books. We have four kind of books. We have hardcover books, and we have paperbacks books. And we are told that we have hardcover books with a fiction, and hardcover books with a non-fiction. We have paperback books which are fiction. And we have paperback books that are non-fiction. We have four kind of books. And we are also told that we have 25 hardcover fiction. This is given. Let's see what they tell us. The first statement tells us that we have a total of 40 fiction books. Total of 40 fiction books. If there are a total of 40 fiction books, and we know we have 25 hardcover fiction, which means we must have 40 minus 25, but we must have 15 15 books which are paper books which are fiction. This is from statement 1. But as you can see, simply knowing how many fiction books that we have does not enable us to figure out how many total books we have because we don't know how many total non-fiction books we have. 
The first term by itself is not enough. A D B C E is not enough. The answer would have to be either B, C, or E, because we do not know how many total non-fiction we have. We have a to total of 40 fiction books. Second statement tells us that we have a total of 60 hardcovers. Total of 60 hardcover books. Again, you should not look at this one. This doesn't exist. This was from statement one, which is why I wrote down. Don't look at it. It doesn't exist. We have 60 hardcover books. Well, let's see what we can do. We have 25 hardcover books here, which are fiction, and we have a total of 60 hardcovers. 60 minus 25, 60 minus 30 would be exactly 30, so which means this must be 35. Oh, sorry. We're looking at hardcovers. We have 25 hardcover fiction, which means we must have 35 hardcover non-fiction. This is from statement 2. Again, simply knowing this part does not tell us how many total books we have. Answer is not B. Even when we put them together, even when we put them together, this part is still missing. We do not know how many paperbacks we have that are non-fiction. And without knowing how many non-fiction paperback we have, we cannot figure out the total. The answer is E. You understand? It's a very straightforward game. The game is very simple. They give us one piece of information because there are four pieces of information. One, two, three, four. They give us one in the problem itself. They give us one piece of information from the first statement. They give us another piece of information from the second statement. That's three so far. The fourth piece of information is still missing. They're just playing games with you. The answer is E. They're just, they're just toying with you. They're just playing with you. 301. Let's go to 302. 302, the question is, is W plus H raised to 4 positive? Is this quantity positive? That's the question. Well, we don't have to worry about H raised to 4. Whether H is positive or negative makes no difference. Even if H is negative, H raised to 4, we know that is positive. So that we do know. That's, that's a fact. What we find out, what we want to find out is, is W positive? That's the question. Is W positive? W is positive, then H to 4 is positive, the whole thing is positive. So that's the actual question. Is W positive? Let's see what the first statement tells us. First statement tells us that H is positive. Knowing that H is positive does absolutely nothing at all for us, because it doesn't matter whether H is positive or not. The first statement, A, D, B, C, E. Typically, we say that the first statement is not enough. Here, actually, the first statement is worthless. It doesn't do anything. The answer cannot be A or D. It's either B, C, or E. Because we want to find out if W is positive somehow. Let's see what the second statement tells us. Second statement tells us, well, what do you know? Second statement tells us that W is positive. That's what we want to find out. We want to know if W is positive, and they tell us W is positive. Second statement by itself is enough. We didn't even have to do any manipulation. They tell you straight out W is positive. The answer is B. Second statement by itself is what we need to know. Second statement by itself does the job. 303. In 303, we are told that we have two integers, A and B, and they are both three digit integers hundreds, tens, and units. Hundreds, tens, and units. Hundreds digits, tens digit, and unit digit. The question is is the product, is the unit digit, is the units digit of A times B something more than 5? This. In other words, when you multiply A, which is a three-digit three number, and B, which is also a three-digit number, when we multiply A and B, does it end in something more than a 5? Let's see what they tell us. The first statement tells us, I'm going to put it here, I'm, I'm going to put it here, the first statement tells us that A, unit digit of A is 4. A ends in a 4. A is a three-digit number that ends in a 4. Simply knowing that A ends in a 4 does not enable us to figure out what does the product end in. Second statement by itself is not enough. A, D, B, C, E. First statement order is not enough. Second statement tells us that B is a three-digit number 
that something is something that ends in a 7. Knowing that the three digit integer b ends in a 7 by itself, knowing that part itself does not enable us to figure out the unit digit of a times b. Second statement by itself is also not enough. But of course when we put them together, we know it doesn't matter what a is, we don't know what b is, it doesn't matter what b is, but when we multiply a and b, it's going to end in an 8. Because 7 times 4 is 28, it's going to end in an 8. Is the unit digit of a times b more than 5? The answer is yes. It is 8. Yes, it is more than 5. The answer is c. When we put them together, we can answer the question. That was 303. Let's look at 304. It says that we donated p percent of profit each year. So we are running a business and in our business, in our farm, we have a habit of donating certain percentage, a fixed percentage, it doesn't change. Every year we donate a fixed percentage of our profit in charity. The question is, was the donation was donation last year greater than ten thousand dollars? Did we donate more than ten thousand dollars last year? That's the question. So we need to know two pieces of information here. We need to know obviously what percentage we donate each year, and we also need to know the profit last year. How much profit did we make last year? If you know the if you know the amount of profit last year, and if you know what percentage we donated, we can answer this question. Was the donation more than 10,000? Let's see what they tell us. The first statement tells us that two years ago we donated $15,000 $15,000 on $3 million profit. But there we go. Now we know how much money we donated and how much, how much profit we can figure out the percentage. The percentage, the P that we're looking for, the P must be $15,000 on a $3 million profit. There you go. That's the, that's the percentage. But we still don't know how much profit we made last year. The first statement does not do the job. The first statement by itself is not enough. It's not worthless. It's very useful information. We know now the percentage. But we still don't know what the profit were last year. Perhaps the second statement will tell us that. The second statement tells us that the last year the profit was two and a half million dollars. There you go. Last year we made a profit of two and a half million dollars. Again, when you're looking at this thing, always remember don't look at the statement number one, we're looking at only statement number two by itself. And simply knowing that the last year we made a profit of two and a half million without knowing the percentages, we cannot answer this question. Second statement by itself is not enough. But putting them to get together, we can answer it. The answer is C. Obviously there is an amount. We know the percentage, we know the profit. It's just two and a half million times this percentage. Now, I'm going to do now something that you should never, ever, ever do in the exam, which is to waste your time to figure out the exact number. I'm just going to do it for the hell of it because I'm curious. Don't do that in the exam. Let's do it on the top. Or we can do it here. So, or we can do it right here. It's 15 times 3,000 times 2.5 million, which is 2,500,000. 2, Divide top and bottom by 100, so that's going to go away. Divide top and bottom by 15, this is going to become 2. There you go, 25 divided by 2 is $12,500. We must have donated twelve and a half thousand dollars last year, but that was absolutely unnecessary. Don't do that. Okay? Don't don't get in the habit of doing this thing. Some people have that nasty habit where they want to solve everything in the on the data sufficiency problems, and which is why they have so much problems, which is why it takes so much time for them because they actually solve the bloody thing. Nobody's asking us. Something that I did here, I should not have done. It wasn't necessary. Three hundred and five. and five asking us is the area of triangle ABC 
less than 20. And the triangle ABC that is given to us looks something like this. We are told that this is X, this is Y, and this is Z. Let's see what the first statement tells us. The first statement tells us that X plus Y squared does not equal Z squared. Telling us that X squared plus Y squared does not equal Z squared is their way of saying that this is not a right angle triangle. Simply knowing that this is not a right angle triangle does not enable us to figure out if the area is less than 20. The first statement, <coughs> the first statement by itself is not enough. Let me let have a little bit of water. Just give me a second. Second statement tells us <coughs> that x plus y is less than thirteen. Again, simply knowing that x plus y is less than 13 does not enable us to answer the question whether or not the area of this triangle is less than 20. Second statement by itself is not enough. Let's put them together, shall we? So if we put them together, maybe we know the sum is 13 and we know it's another right angle triangle. Let's look at two extreme examples. Let's look at two extreme examples. One is already here. Let me, let me draw another extreme example. Let's draw it. If it's a right angle triangle, and if it's 6 by 7, you see 6 plus 7, we are told that x plus y is less than, thir less than 13, but this is the extreme example. In that case, the answer would be 1 half times 6 times 7, 6 times 7 is 42, this is 21. But we are told that it is not a right angle triangle. We know it's not a right angle triangle. So maybe this, instead of sitting straight, maybe this angle is 89.99, or maybe it is 90.001. In either way, the height is not going to be 7, it's going to be something less than 7. Whether it's tilted this way or that way, the height is going to be slightly less than 7. It is not a right angle triangle. If the height is something less than 7, this is going to be something less than 21. The question now is, is something less than 21 less than 20? That's the question. And the answer to that question is, maybe. We have no way of knowing that. Another possibility is this, where maybe Maybe this is 6 and this is, or rather, let's, let's make it extreme as I said. Let's make it extreme. We are told that the sum of x and y is less than 13. So let's make this 12 and let's make this guy something less than 1. From here to here, something less than 1. In which case, the height, if we drop a perpendicular, if this is more than, less than 1, this is also even, even lower than 1. In this case, the area is going to be 1 half base, which is 12 times something less than 1. <coughs> 12 times something less than 1. <coughs> I'm losing my voice. Just give me one second. <coughs> 12 times something less than 1 is something less than 12, obviously. Half of that is going to be something less than 6. Is something less than 6 less than 20? The answer here is yes. In this scenario, the answer is yes. But if you're looking at something like this, the answer is maybe. We do not know. Putting the two statements together does not get us anywhere. Does not get us anywhere at all. The answer is E. Number six of number three oh six. <coughs> number three hundred and six. I don't know why I'm losing my voice. In 306, we are told that we have A, B, C, D that lie on a line. A, B, C, D, they lie on a line. They also tell us that C is the midpoint of A, B. Oh, so it's not like that. A, it's not like that. I need to change this thing. Let's switch them. This is C and this is B. And this is equal to that. Because C is the midpoint of A, B. They also tell us that D is the midpoint of CB. Let's see where CB is. CB. Right. So D is not there. D is not there. D lies here. And this distance is the same as this distance. Because D is the midpoint. And what we want to find out is 
the distance d to b. This is the distance we want to find out d to b. But we know d to b, let me write down the d properly. We know that d to b has to, has, has to be equal to c to d because d is the midpoint of c to b. You understand? Let's see what they're told. Statement 1 tells us that a to c, a to c is something more than 8. The distance from a to c is something more than 8. Let's see how they phrase it. They said the length of line segment a to c is greater than 8. Now if they tell you greater than 8, for the time being, let's just pretend it's 8. a to c is 8. If a to c is 8, which means this is 4 and this is 4. Now when we when you put in your 8, and even though they tell us something it's more than 8, as I already told you before many times, that 8 is not an 8, it's slightly more than 8, whatever it is, slightly more than 8, maybe it's 8.00001, in which case this quantity is slightly more than 4. So in this case, it's slightly more than 4. Or maybe they tell you that it's more than 8, they tell us, they tell us that A to C is more than 8, maybe instead of being something slightly more than 8, Maybe it's 80, in which case this will be 40 and this will be 40. What we're trying to say here is that there's no way to figure out the distance from B to B by simply knowing that A to C is something more than 8. The first statement, the first statement by itself is not enough. Let's look at the second statement. That was the first statement. The second statement tells us that C to D is something more than 6. So let's erase all of this thing. Second statement tells us that d c to d is something more than c. Oh, there you go. If c to d is something more than 6, we are told in the second statement, if c to d is something more than 6, then d to b is same as c to d because d is the midpoint, which means the d to b must also be something more than 6. Oh, I miswrote the question. The question is not how much is... I miswrote the question. The question is not how much is d to b. The question was is d to b more than 5? And we can answer the question now. Is d to b more than 5? The answer is it has to be more than 5 because it's more than 6. The answer is, which means the second statement by itself answers the question. The answer is b. I miswrote the question. That was 306. Let's do the very last problem on the page 307. Some questions are quite straightforward and simple, as you saw, three or four examples of those, and some are a little bit more complicated. One that we are about to do is a little bit more involved, so pay attention. 307. In 307, we are told that people are standing in a line. So a whole bunch of people standing in a line, a whole bunch of people, and we are told that Adam is standing in a line, and we are told Beth is standing in a line with some people standing between them, some people standing between them. We also told the number of people that are standing in front of Adam, let's call it X, and the number of people standing behind Bath, let's call it Y, is 18. One more time, we have, we have people are standing in a line, Adam is standing in a line, Beth is standing in a line, we are told that there are some people standing in the middle of Adam and Beth, let's call it M, M for the middle, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, six, whatever it is. Do you understand? Some people are standing between Adam and Beth, we're calling it M. Some people are standing in front of Adam, some people are standing behind Beth. And we know the number, of, we are told the number of people that are standing in front of Adam and the number of people standing behind Beth, that total is 18. And what we want to find out is how many people are standing behind Beth. Do you understand? Very good. Now we have a setup, let's, let's look at what they tell us. The first statement tells us that there are 32 total people. The total number of people in the line is 32. Let's write the equation. So the number of people that are standing in front of Adam, we're calling it x. And then we have Adam. And then we have number of people between Adam and Beth, we're calling it m for the middle. Then we have Beth. And then we have number of people standing behind Beth, which we're calling y, which is what we want to find out. And we are told that this is equal to 32. But we are also told, this is given, this is given to us, we are told, we know that the number of people that are standing in front of Adam and the number of standing, people standing behind Bath is 18. x plus y is 18. So let's put it together here. 
x x plus y x plus y plus 1 and 1 that's 2 1 and 1 that's 2 plus m has to equal 32 did I leave out anything? let's just double check so that's 2 is from Adam and Beth x plus y, x plus y and m, that's 32 we know x plus y is 18, let's put it in here so 18 plus 2 plus m has to equal 32 which means m must be 32 minus 20 which is 12 so we know there are 12 people standing between Adam and Beth but simply knowing that there are 12 people standing between Adam and Beth does not enable us to figure out how many people are standing behind Beth we want to find out how many people are standing behind her we cannot figure that out A, D, B, C, E the first statement by itself is not enough let's look at second statement I have left no room for myself I'm going to have to erase all of this thing, we are done the first statement, remember this comes from the first statement so when we look at the second statement we cannot use that information, do you understand? let's look at second statement all we know is that the first statement by itself is not enough second statement tells us that there are 23 people 23 people behind Adam second statement tells us there are 23 people behind Adam let's see how many people are standing behind Adam so that's Adam so we have m number of people between Adam and Beth and then we have Beth that's, that one is for Beth and then we have y number of people behind Beth and that has to equal 23 because that's how many people are standing behind Adam again one more time behind Adam would be number of people between Adam and Beth which is m for the middle people people standing in the middle between Adam and Beth then the Beth itself, this, this one is for Beth this one represents Beth and there are y number of people standing behind her again by itself we cannot do anything, we want to find out the y we want to find out the y since we do not know the m we cannot figure out the y there we go as soon as we put the two statements together the first statement tells us the m is 12 so if we put them together then we can answer the question the answer is c we know when we put them together the first statement tells us that the m is 12 and second statement tells us this part second, second statement gives us this, this equation this equation plus knowing the fact from first statement that m is equal to 12 we can figure out the y the answer is c it's 13, 13 minus 23 y is 10 again we didn't have to do that I just did it for the hell of it because I couldn't resist it. So the answer is yes. Can, we can answer the question how many people are standing behind bat? We can answer the question there are 10 people standing behind bat only if we put the two statements together. The answer is C. We need both A. We need both statement 1 and 2. That was the end of the page. That seems like a logical place to stop. We'll meet again tomorrow. We'll pick up from where we left off. In the meantime, if you wish to get hold of me, very simple. Go to my website at keshwaniprep.com from there you can send me an email or you can fill out the form if you wish to tell me a little bit about yourself and we'll talk some more if you wish to work with me if you would like to hire me to help you prepare for the exam okay bye now